Hi, it's Katrina. Egyptian kings from heaven. There is a document known as the Turin King List. It's an extremely old piece of papyrus from about 3,000 years ago, created by scribes during the reign of Ramses II. The list is filled chronologically with the names of Egyptian rulers. In fact, it is the most extensive list from ancient Egypt that details the kings and overlords of the great nation. However, the beginning of the list was never found, and neither was the end of it, and so it's not totally complete. Scholars have been able to learn a lot of information from the list. It details the names of the rulers, how long they were in power, including months and days, and even which rulers were connected by family. It's basically a cheat sheet going back thousands of years for the entire history of the ruling class in Egypt. But there's something very mysterious about the Turin King List, and one major problem. Not only does it name rulers going back to the 15th dynasty, but it also lists mythical kings and gods. Mixed in with the names of the normal human kings are legendary beings that supposedly ruled Egypt, creatures that came down from the sky to take over the country. Many of these are listed as having ruled the kingdom before the days of the pharaohs. Obviously, there's a bit of confusion here. If the list is to be believed, Egypt was dominated by god kings who ruled over a mythical time in Egypt's history, before the days of the pharaohs. Either Egypt really was first ruled by godly beings from the sky, or the Egyptians just believed that such a time existed in what they thought of as their ancient past. The First Exorcism in France, during the 1590s, there was a young woman by the name of Martha Brossier. She became a pretty well-known celebrity because it was widely believed she was possessed by demons. But it wasn't only her possession that made her famous. It was the fact that her parents took her on tour. They went from town to town and put on a show, with Martha Brossier and the demon inside of her drawing packed crowds of spectators. According to the old reports, the girl's eyes would roll back in her head, she would flick her tongue out like a snake, and convulse while growling in a deep and demonic voice. This was so outrageous that even King Henry IV got himself involved. He decided the girl needed to be cured of the demon inside her, and so he ordered what became the first scientifically controlled exorcism. A group of high priests gathered around the girl, placed a piece of wood in her mouth to keep her from swallowing her tongue, sprinkled her with holy water, and recited holy scripture while the demon inside of her screamed in misery. But what Martha didn't realize was that the exorcism was fake. It was just normal water she was being sprinkled with, and the holy scripture was just Latin poetry. The whole thing was a scientific experiment, something set up by the king himself to expose Martha and her family as the fraud. The Vatican Mythographers The Vatican Mythographers are a group of unknown authors responsible for writing a small collection of medieval texts. These unknown people, with ties directly to the Vatican, wrote down Latin translations of all the Greek and Roman myths they could find. All of these texts were then put into a single medieval manuscript, which was published later on in 1831 by Cardinal Angelo Mai. The thing about these translations is that they very well may have shaped our modern understanding of mythology, specifically that of ancient Greece and Rome. As you may already know, most fairy tales, stories like Cinderella and Hansel and Gretel, are actually pretty horrifying in their original forms. These were tales of caution from hundreds of years ago told to children to keep them well behaved. And in the same way, the ancient Greek myths were altered into Christian fairy tales by the Vatican mythographers. They took the original stories and rewrote them to fit their own Christian purposes. Not everything in the stories was changed, but when these manuscripts were written in the 12th century, roughly 234 myths were retold through the Christian lens. Everything we know about gods like Zeus and Hades, and the legends of those like Medusa and Perseus, it's all a byproduct of the Vatican mythographers. Aztec God's Flesh The use of psychedelic mushrooms can be traced back over 6,000 years. Some of the oldest surviving evidence of prehistoric people eating mushrooms to have a hallucinogenic experience is in Villar del Humo, Spain. That's where scientists have uncovered cave paintings displaying psychoactive mushrooms. In Spain, prehistoric humans munched on Psilocybe hispanica, 
the only native Spanish mushroom known to get a person high. On the other side of the world, the Mesoamerican cultures feasted on something called Psilocybe Aztecorum, or the Aztec God's Flesh Mushrooms. It was the Aztec who had a particular hunger for these fascinating psychedelic shrooms. In fact, many historians believe that hallucinogenic substances played a massive part in Aztec religious life. And it wasn't only mushrooms. A research study by Bernardino de Sahagún identified five key substances the Aztecs used to keep themselves in a pretty constant state of intoxication, including the slime from the bufo toad. The bare truth is that the Aztec had a serious issue with hallucinogens. They used these kinds of substances during festivals, at celebrations, whenever an important person came over for a meeting. It was a major part of the culture and was used in all rituals involving divination, dream interpretation, prophecy, and even ordinary healing. If you went to see the doctor during the days of the Aztec, chances are the doctor was out of his mind on mushrooms. Hatshepsut's Myrrh Tree There is a very mysterious tree in Egypt whose roots can apparently be traced back to one of the most famous queens in history. Her name is Hatshepsut, and if it had been up to one very bitter pharaoh, we wouldn't even know her name because she was nearly erased from the history books. After her stepson Tutmos III came into power following her death, he immediately began destroying all records and accounts of Hatshepsut's rule. Scholars believe it was revenge because Tutmos had wanted to inherit the throne from his father, but she had seized it instead and ruled for years. She had actually become one of the most respected rulers in ancient history, and so her stepson sourly tried to delete her from existence. But he failed, and today we know all about Hatshepsut's great accomplishments. However, there is one great thing Hatshepsut did that's a little more mysterious than the others. There is a myrrh tree at Hatshepsut's mortuary temple on the Nile. It's a withered old tree stump, somehow still standing despite being beaten by the Egyptian sun for thousands of years. It was put there 3,500 years ago, allegedly brought back from one of Hatshepsut's expeditions to the mysterious land of Punt. What's so mysterious is that nobody knows where the land of Punt actually is or was. Some scholars believe it was Somalia, but that's never been confirmed. All we know is the Egyptians thought of Punt as a land of great intrigue, exotic delights, and magic. The ancient Egyptians thought of Punt the same way we think of the ancient Egyptians. And apparently, Queen Hatshepsut brought this very tree back from the unknown exotic land. And, as if by magic, it is still standing in front of her temple all these years later. The Spear of Destiny No other holy relic in the world goes by so many names. I'm talking about the Spear of Destiny, the Holy Lance, the Lance of Longinus, the Spear of Longinus, and even the Spear of Christ. These are all the names that were given to the lance that supposedly pierced Jesus' side as he was crucified on the cross. The lance is described in detail in the Gospel of John. Now, nobody can say for sure if the spear was real because nobody even knows if Jesus truly existed. However, the spear was allegedly rediscovered by Helena of Constantinople when she traveled to the Holy Land sometime around 300 AD. It became an important relic in the Middle Ages and played a significant role in several of the Crusaders' biggest battles. And then it vanished. Nobody knows where it is today, but there is a bizarre rumor that Adolf Hitler had an obsession with the spear and sent his own men to find it. It's also important to note that there are a lot of fakes out there. There is a holy lance held in a museum in Vienna that was supposedly wielded by the soldier Longinus. And then there's the story of Dr. Howard Buchner. The doctor says that the spear was sent to Antarctica with a whole bunch of other Nazi treasures after the end of World War II. Then, in the 1970s, those treasures were rediscovered by a secret Nazi society and are now being hidden in Europe. Mysterious Ancient Tooth There is some very strange science happening regarding our ancient ancestors. A tooth which once belonged to a young girl was discovered in a cave in the Southeast Asian country of Laos. The tooth is 164,000 years old, and it belonged to a human lineage scientists call the Denisovans. The only other evidence of this bizarre form of ancient humans has come from other caves in Siberia and China. 
Finding a tooth from the exact same type of mysterious humanoid in Laos shows that the Denisovans must have lived in a wide range of environments, conditions, and latitudes. They lived all the way from the tropical forests of Southeast Asia to the freezing cold of the Siberian tundra. But just who were these ancient people, so distantly related to us on our human family tree? The experts aren't entirely sure. What they do say is that about 700,000 years ago, modern humans separated from Neanderthals and Denisovans. And then, about 400,000 years ago, the Neanderthals and Denisovans diverged. Although, for the next several hundred thousand years, they continued to mate with humans. The truth is that scientists don't know a lot about them. All they found so far are five confirmed fossils, consisting of three teeth, one finger bone, and a single jawbone. Canaanite Goddess While cultivating some fields near the city of Khan Yunis near the Gaza Strip, a farmer came across an extraordinarily rare sculpture. The sculpture dates back 4,500 years. It's a stone head which had broken off of its body centuries ago. And while it's a little difficult to identify the face of the statue beyond any doubt, archaeologists believe it could very well be the Canaanite goddess Anat. Anat was the goddess of love, beauty, and also war in the mythology of the Canaanites. This is according to Jamal Abu Rida, the local ministry director, who said her statue was discovered with a snake crown, which was once the symbol of strength and invincibility for the Canaanites. It was the Canaanites who lived in the ancient territory of Canaan, what is today Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. They are considered to be one of the oldest civilizations in human history. Anat was a truly remarkable goddess and was worshipped by everyone from the Canaanites to the Egyptians. This is something not a lot of people know. In ancient times, gods were basically like celebrities. The most popular would be passed around by word of mouth, they would become more popular in different cultures, and then you had deities like Anat and Zeus being worshipped across all of the Mediterranean. In fact, Anat became so popular that she morphed and turned into a whole bunch of different goddesses in the ancient world. She would even go on to become the goddess Athena in Greek mythology. The Greeks took Anat, moved some letters around, made her a goddess of wisdom, and that was that. Stonehenge Hunting Pits The mystery of Stonehenge just keeps getting stranger. Researchers have just discovered hunting pits dated at over 10,000 years old, made far before the actual stones were ever erected at this ancient monument. The find was made by archaeologists with the University of Birmingham. The pits are about 13 feet wide and over 6 feet deep and were made by hunter-gatherers between 8,200 BC and 7,800 BC. This was during the Mesolithic period, just after the Ice Age came to an end. The first important thing to note is that the hunting pits have nothing to do with Stonehenge itself. Rather, it all has to do with this specific part of England. These are some of the oldest prehistoric pits that have ever been excavated, and it shows that people were continuously drawn to this area for about 7,000 years. From primitive people all the way to the Bronze Age, from living in caves to practicing agriculture. The mystery is that we still have no idea what drew human beings to Stonehenge. Even thousands of years before the first stones were put up, humans were digging holes all around the site. It's almost as if there is something in the soil here that drew ancient humans directly to this spot. The Secret Greek Gods Even in the days of ancient Greece, some knowledge and some beliefs were considered forbidden. While gods like Zeus and Poseidon may have been mainstream, there were other gods who were worshipped by a secret underground cult. These gods were called the Kabaidi. This mysterious cult was so secret that we still don't know much about it today. Historians believe the cultist activity was centered on the islands of Lemnos and Samothrace. However, the worship of the Kabaidi gods could have taken place outside of Greece as well. One of the most important places of worship for these discreet cult members was the Sanctuary of the Great Gods, or the Samothrace Temple Complex. It was built to the west of the city, just at the fringe of civilization. We don't know all the gods they worshipped, but we do know that they had a special place for the divine witch Hecate, the fertility goddess Demeter, and her daughter Persephone, and the sea divinities called Daemonies. Archaeological evidence suggests there were two main figures at the core of this cult, 
but nobody has ever been able to identify them. The Index Librorum Prohibitorum The Catholic Church's history of censorship dates at least as far back as the 9th century. Still, one of its more extreme attempts to control its followers came with the publishing of the Index Librorum Prohibitorum in 1560. Established by Pope Paul IV, it was essentially a list of thousands of books and publications that Catholic worshippers were banned from reading. Perhaps the most dramatic form of censorship in Christendom, the Index was not limited to theology. It banned works ranging from love stories to philosophical treatises to political theory. The Index prohibited both religious and secular works, as well as versions of the Bible that the Church had not approved. Many were written by intellectuals and were about topics like astronomy and philosophy. The invention of the printing press had made reading material far more accessible than ever before, and Catholic authorities saw this type of thought-provoking and scholarly material as a threat to its followers' faith. Pope Paul IV created the Index partially as a response to this increased availability of literature, which officials believed might encourage people to question or stop believing what the Church told them. Twenty subsequent editions were issued over the next several hundred years, with the final version being published in 1948. It was only enforceable within the Papal States and in places where civil governments adopted it, which happened in several Italian states. The Catholic Church formally abolished the Index Librorum Prohibitorum in 1966. Instead of replacing it, officials left it up to each individual to discern what types of material are dangerous to their spiritual well-being. In announcing these changes, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith reminded followers that they have a responsibility to use sound moral judgment in making these decisions and avoiding anything that might poison their faith. Poveglia in northern Italy's Venetian lagoon, less than a half mile from Venice, the tiny island of Poveglia first appeared on the historical record during the 5th century. It remained inhabited until 1379, when its residents fled because of warfare. Starting in 1776, Poveglia was used as a quarantine station for plague victims and sufferers of other diseases before being converted into a mental hospital in 1922. The island has been vacant since the asylum closed in 1968, despite recent efforts to repurpose it into a luxury vacation resort. As much as half of Poveglia's soil contains human remains left behind by the over 160,000 patients who died there. Archaeologists have uncovered mass graves containing the remains of hundreds of plague victims on nearby islands, but have yet to fully explore Poveglia. Legend holds that a doctor who worked at the island's mental hospital tortured and killed patients before butchering them. While these claims remain unsubstantiated, the hospital's remains are still there, being slowly reclaimed by nature. Meanwhile, many paranormal enthusiasts believe Poveglia is haunted. But the island remains off-limits to visitors, and there is no word on if or when it will open up to the public. The Destruction of China's Past China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, began making power plays at the young age of 13, when he became the head of his state and had his mother's lover executed because he was a perceived threat to the young man's power. He ruled as the Qin Dynasty's first emperor from 221 to 210 BC, during which time he got rid of any material that scholars might use to challenge his supremacy. Acting on the advice of his chief advisor, Li Si, Qin Shi Huang is said to have ordered the destruction of nearly all previously existing books within the empire. The only exceptions were literary works on astrology, agriculture, medicine, divination, and the history of the Qin state. Anyone who was caught with certain ancient works, such as the Book of Songs or the Classic of History, faced brutal punishment. The year after the ban went into effect, Qin Shi Huang reportedly buried 460 scholars alive after they were caught with the forbidden books. Another account claims that the emperor had killed alchemists after they had fooled him into thinking they held the secret to eternal life. Either way, it's clear that Qin Shi Huang sought to destroy any historical records that failed to fall neatly in place with his narrative, and his mission succeeded leaving modern historians with gaps in their quest to understand the past. Ovid's Banned Books The Roman poet Ovid lived from 43 BC to 17 or 18 AD during the reign of Augustus. He was extremely popular yet controversial during his time, 
often focusing on erotic themes that Augustus found inappropriate and felt that the public needed protection from. Without consulting the Roman Senate, the emperor banished Ovid to the island of Tomis on the Black Sea. Augustus took particular offense to Ars Amatoria, or The Art of Love, a three-book series that was meant as a guide to help men find and keep women, and to advise women on how to win and keep a man's love. Ovid's well-intending advice may have been interpreted by Augustus as a threat to the monogamous marital standards he encouraged among the population. His goal was to increase the Roman birth rate, but this was just the first of several times that Ovid's works would be banned from society. In 1497, during the burning of the Vanities, followers of the Dominican priest Girolamo Savonarola collected and burned tens of thousands of supposedly immoral objects in Florence, Italy. Included among them were all of Ovid's works, which were also burned in England in the bishop's ban of 1599. The poet's writing was even banned from being imported into the United States in 1928, when customs officials prohibited an English translation of Ars Amatoria from entering the country. The ban was lifted two years later owing to a legal exception that allowed books of literary or scientific merit that were otherwise considered immoral to be allowed into the United States. The Picatrix Originally written in Arabic during the 10th or 11th century, the Picatrix is the Latin name for a 400-page book about magic and astrology. Nobody knows who wrote it. Historian Ibn Khaldun attributed the book's authorship to an astronomer and mathematician named Maslama al-Majriti, but experts had since proven that this is unlikely, based on passages in the Picatrix that are believed to date back to when al-Majriti was a young child. The book's origins have been traced to Moorish Spain, which encompassed the Muslim-ruled portion of the Iberian Peninsula when it was written. In 1256, King Alfonso X of Castile ordered the book to be translated into Latin, leading to its circulation throughout Europe from 1450 to 1600. As a result, the Picatrix had a profound influence on medieval and Renaissance magic, as well as philosophy and other scholarly disciplines. It was a controversial work, leading some who studied and praised it to avoid mentioning any parts of the book that seemed to run contrary to Christianity. But, as historian Avner ben Zaken pointed out, the Picatrix resonated with several Renaissance thinkers who were unfriendly to the establishment. And at some point, both the Arabic and Latin versions of it fell into obscurity until their rediscovery in the early 20th century. The Picatrix was essential for turning natural magic into philosophy, converting a sorcerer into an experimentalist, and altering the practice of natural magic into an official education system. It encouraged the application that scholars shift their focus from tradition and dogma to the distant sources of natural magic. Taliban Totalitarianism Afghanistan was uniquely located along ancient trade routes, historically serving as a connection between the East and the West. Traders from many parts of the world passed through, turning it into a culturally diverse center of commerce. And in recent decades, a lot of this history was preserved. That all changed when the Taliban rose to power, causing archaeological excavations to grind to a halt, and ultimately leading to the destruction of tens of thousands of ancient sites and artifacts. When the Taliban reconquered Afghanistan, archaeologists and museum curators scrambled to secure the historical sites and artifacts that they still had access to. They were worried that the extremely conservative Islamic fundamentalist group would go around destroying valuable history, much as they had in 2001. During this earlier round of destruction, Taliban founder Mullah Omar ordered his militants to destroy a pair of monumental sculptures known as the Buddhas of Bamiyan. Standing at 180 feet and 125 feet tall, the statues were carved into a cliffside 8,200 feet above sea level during the 6th and 7th centuries. Under Omar's strict religious views, they were considered idols, and these are just two of many landmarks and artifacts that received the same label and have been lost to history at the Taliban's hands. The group also destroyed nearly 2,800 statues and other works of art at the Kabul Museum and some 55,000 literary works at the Pui Kumuri Public Library, which housed some of the nation's most historically valuable texts. Some suspected that Omar ordered the destruction as retaliation against Western countries for imposing economic sanctions on Afghanistan, and that the acts had less to do with his beliefs than he claimed. 
Either way, these ancient treasures from what was once a major cultural crossroads are gone forever. William Tyndale's New Testament Along with the printing press came increased literacy in societies where reading and writing were once reserved for the more privileged classes. Now that commoners had ready access to printed materials, they began learning these skills in large numbers. This proved troubling for some religious institutions, which felt threatened by the possibility of people reading and interpreting the Bible on their own. After all, up to that point, many, if not most, worshippers simply trusted that what the church told them was true and that it was commanded by scripture. In England, it was illegal to translate the Bible into English or any other common language, and people were also forbidden from owning these illegal translations. Getting caught with one could come with the death penalty. William Tyndale was a forward-thinking biblical scholar who knew that the times were changing. He asked the Bishop of London to revoke the ban on English translations and to sponsor the publication of an English New Testament. The bishop refused, but Tyndale mass-produced the book in secret. Many copies were smuggled into England and other places where the translation was unwelcome, sending authorities after Tyndale. He was arrested in Antwerp in 1535 and was held prisoner at a castle in Belgium until late the following year, when he was strangled and burned at the stake for his decision to make the Bible available to everyone. Tyndale's New Testament remains one of history's most influential literary works, despite the extremes that were taken to try and squash it out of existence. It even coined several phrases that many people use regularly without realizing where they originated, including the powers that be, eat, drink, and be merry, and fight the good fight. Nazi Book Burning As the Nazi Party rose to power, an association of German university students created blacklists of political and literary works that they deemed to be un-German. The lists included books by Albert Einstein, Ernest Hemingway, renowned poet and playwright Bertolt Brecht, novelist Eric Maria Remarque, and others who rank among history's most influential thinkers and creators. Many of them were Jewish. Starting on May 10, 1933, these student groups carried out a series of book burnings at universities throughout the country. In Berlin, Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels delivered a speech to a crowd of 40,000, proclaiming that Jewish intellectualism is dead. Thousands of books were lit ablaze at these gatherings while students marched in unity against the so-called un-German spirit. After the initial book burnings, the Nazis continued on their campaign to eliminate books by Jewish writers and others whom they viewed as a challenge to Hitler's extremist rhetoric from the public consciousness. The Germans burned millions of books in its occupied territories, including Poland, where 80% of the country's school libraries and three-quarters of its scientific libraries were destroyed. The Great Library of Alexandria The burning of the Great Library at Alexandria in northern Egypt is one of history's best-known travesties. Founded in 283 BC, it was, at one point, the ancient world's largest library, housing over 100 full-time scholars and containing texts by renowned thinkers and writers like Homer, Plato, and Socrates. Even more impressively, it didn't admit visitors based on wealth, unlike other libraries of the time, but was open to anyone who proved to be a worthy scholar. Legend holds that the Great Library of Alexandria burned to the ground at some point, taking hundreds of thousands of valuable literary works with it but evidence suggests that its decline was much more gradual than experts previously believed, and budget shortfalls played a major role in the library's downfall. The first alleged fire at the Alexandria Library occurred around 40 AD, when Julius Caesar and his invading forces set it on fire, marking the first in a series of destructive battles and blazes over the following centuries. Government spending cuts and other policy changes helped immensely with tipping the Great Library at Alexandria into non-existence. When Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius revoked resident scholars' pay and banned foreign scholars from visiting, he effectively closed the library down, leaving its precious contents neglected and forgotten. Religious riots further damaged the Learning Center in 391 and 415 AD, and the library met its ultimate end in the year 640, when it was captured by Arab forces, who reportedly gathered the remaining manuscripts and used them as fuel for thousands of bathhouses. 
Francois Lolone. Francois Lolone is considered by almost every historian to be the cruelest buccaneer who ever lived. He had a ferocious temper, committed terrible atrocities, and brutalized his prisoners in ways that other pirates never did. We have to go back to the beginning when his given name was Jean David No, born in France in 1635. He was originally sold to a master as a young child, taken to the Caribbean, and held there as a servant until 1660. And that was when he joined the buccaneer stationed at Saint-Domingue. He had been a servant all his life and had grown up with plenty of nastiness. The opportunity to get on a pirate ship and rob and kill Spaniards was just too good to pass up. After working himself up through the ranks, Francois was given his very own ship to command. And when he started off on his own, he had a very specific way that he did business. He killed every single person on the ships he plundered as a matter of pirate principle. And he even started organizing land attacks, not just focusing on naval thievery. Francois teamed up with another pirate named Michel de Basco. Together, they raised an army of about 600 pirates spread across eight ships. They then went through the Gulf of Venezuela and attacked cities indiscriminately. They killed thousands of people, tortured citizens, and burned whole towns to the ground. The only issue is that the loot wasn't very good because these were poor rural villages along the coast. They didn't have any treasure. Most of the pirates ended up leaving, and then Francois tried to take over all of Nicaragua. But on his way there in 1668, he was captured by a group of indigenous people, and they knew exactly who he was. So they cut the pirate into pieces and burned him. Sir Henry Morgan Sir Henry Morgan is the same captain you're probably thinking of, the guy on the Captain Morgan rum bottle. But Morgan didn't start out as a rum-drinking pirate. He began his naval career as a wealthy privateer operating in the Caribbean. He later became the governor of Jamaica, and after that, a bloodthirsty pirate. But Captain Morgan was a more refined pirate than many of those active back in the 1600s. The captain was a political man, a military leader, and something of a strategic genius. He also hated the Spanish. Morgan didn't turn to piracy only for the sake of getting rich, although it certainly helped. His ultimate goal was to damage the Spanish Empire, and that's exactly what he did. For 20 years, Captain Morgan hurt the Spanish wherever he could. One of his most famous attacks was in the city of Portobello in 1668. Morgan besieged the city with a massive force of buccaneers. Portobello was a huge treasure port for Spain, where they kept mass amounts of silver that was being gathered from mines in South America. Morgan had only two ships and 700 men. He used those ships to distract the Spaniards that were manning the fortresses, while he secretly landed 500 men a couple of miles away from the major town. Since the Spanish were expecting to be attacked from the sea, they never expected the small army coming up from the town to their fortress. But here's what was so especially brutal about it. When the pirates came up from the town, they had prisoners with them, specifically women, priests, nuns, children, and they used these people as human shields. Chen Yi Sao One pirate you may not have heard of is Chen Yi Sao a brutal female pirate from China who dominated the coastlines of Asia between 1795 and 1810. Not only was she a fierce buccaneer and one of the most successful wealthy pirates of all time, but she was basically a pirate queen. At her peak, she was in command of over 70,000 pirates spread across 1,200 vessels. That was a force larger than the Spanish Armada. If Chen had been so inclined, she probably could have defeated the Spanish and British at sea and left their operations in the Caribbean and South and Central America completely crippled. What makes her so fascinating is how she pulled this huge pirate army together. She started her career as a pirate after leaving her job as a Lady of the Night. She then married a pirate and joined him at sea. Together, they organized rogue pirate gangs into one main confederation. When her husband died suddenly and mysteriously, Cheng Yi Sao quickly became known as the almighty ruler of the Pirate Confederation and squashed any potential squabbles for power. During her brief time as a commander, she caused terror all along the coast of China, robbing, killing, and selling humans into slavery. She only stopped when things felt like they could fall apart, but she didn't hide off on some island and bury her treasure. She demanded a pardon from the Chinese government 
They gave her one, and she spent the rest of her life running a small smuggling racket inside a gambling house on the mainland. She lived to be almost 70 years old. Charles Vane Charles Vane had a career of about five years. We know little about his early life other than he was probably born around 1680 somewhere in England. After a brief naval career, Charles moved to Nassau, put together a small crew of pirates, and started looting. But his career was brief and bloody. He was cruel in his dealings with prisoners, and when he took a ship, he didn't just tie people up or throw them overboard. He would beat, torture, and then kill the sailors in the worst ways imaginable. He even had a chance to step away from piracy in 1718 when the king offered him a pardon. Charles agreed to take the pardon, but immediately went right back to his life of crime. Then, in 1719, Charles got caught in a storm. He was marooned on an uncharted island and was later discovered by a passing British ship. Sadly for him, they knew exactly who he was and brought him straight to Port Royal. He spent the next two years in a jail cell before ultimately being hanged in March 1721. Captain Kidd Captain William Kidd had some of the worst luck of any pirate who ever sailed the high seas. He had the unfortunate luck of being born at the very end of the golden age of piracy. Pirates had just enjoyed a very long run of moderate freedom and success, but all of that was ending. This made Captain Kidd one of the very last legitimate pirates before the world moved on. The captain started out as a successful privateer in the 1690s while England and France were at war. Kidd was charged with defending trade routes going from America to England. He was also tasked with combating pirates in the Indian Ocean. His mission was to rid the sea of piracy once and for all. And if he had to destroy some enemy ships and secure their valuable cargo to do it, that was what he would do. The very first pirate he tried to capture was Robert Culliford in 1696. Unfortunately, Captain Kidd wasn't actually that great at finding pirates. After a long time at sea with nothing happening, his crew turned on him. They mutinied and forced Kidd to give up his search for the pirate and become a pirate himself. In 1698, they attacked a merchant vessel and stole its cargo of silk, sugar, and opium. What Captain Kidd didn't know was that in those two years he'd been gone, the mood had changed in England regarding piracy. Pirates were to be completely eradicated, and stealing from another ship was now a criminal act. When he arrived in the West Indies in 1699, they were hunting pirates like witches. Kidd buried some of his treasure on Gardner's Island and Block Island, then was arrested on July 7, 1699, when he landed in Boston. He was found guilty of murder and piracy and hanged on May 23, 1701. He'd only ever stolen one load of cargo and had only done it because he failed at being a pirate hunter. Would you rather have been a pirate or a pirate hunter? Let me know in the comments below. Black Bart. Black Bart, whose real name was John Roberts, was one of the most successful pirates the world has ever seen. We don't know the exact numbers, but most historians agree he plundered somewhere around 400 ships during his career. The main reason he was so successful was that he was brutal, bold, and fearless. He would terrorize every ship that he encountered while sailing through the Caribbean Sea, even ships that were obviously far superior to his. He would go up against warships and the most fearsome vessels that most pirates would avoid at all costs. And like most pirates, he had a real mean streak of violence in him. They called him Black Bart because his heart was as black as coal. He once captured a slaving ship with 80 slaves shackled down in the hull. Rather than save the slaves or at least let them go, he burned the ship with them still on board. He was an absolutely heinous person and he met his death soon after in 1722 at the end of a noose. Calico Jack John Rackham, also known by his nickname Calico Jack, is most famous for being the guy who came up with the pirate flag. Its real name is the Jolly Roger flag, and it's probably one of the most famous flags in the world. The skull and two cross swords, or the skull and crossbones, is the sign of piracy in nearly every single place you go in the world. John Rackham was a rather unusual man, a pirate who terrorized ships around the Bahamas and Cuba. He is famous these days because he was one of the few pirate captains who had two female pirates on his crew, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. He's also famous because he was a pretty terrible pirate. Most of his plundering was done on tiny ships close to the shore. In 1719, he captured the Kingston, which had a massive cargo, but because he was caught in the act, 
bounty hunters came and took the loot away, and Rackham was nearly killed. Calico Jack only wriggled his way out of being hung by lying to the governor of Nassau and saying that Charles Vane, a different pirate, had forced him to steal that cargo. This was around the time he started having an affair with Anne Bonny, the wife of a sailor who worked for the governor. When he found out about the affair, Anne and Calico Jack ran away and sailed around the Caribbean for two months, capturing ships where they could. But in 1720, Rackham was finally captured in Jamaica and hanged. Jean Lafitte Jean Lafitte was a pirate from 1810 to 1820 who liked to do his pillaging in the Gulf of Mexico. He set himself up with a secluded base in Barataria Bay, south of New Orleans. It was hidden behind shallow waterways and deep in the bayou, which made him almost impossible to find. It was also close enough to New Orleans that he could easily take his cargo there to be sold. It was from his secret base that Lafitte put together a massive team of smugglers and pirates. Because this was just after the golden age of piracy, this wasn't as much about looting and stealing as it was about selling goods and humans. And that's what made Jean Lafitte such a dirty scoundrel. He was basically a slave trader who kept people stuck in pens on Grand Terre Island, then dragged them through the swamps to be sold at secret auctions in Louisiana. It would be Andrew Jackson who eventually employed Jean Lafitte and his pirates in the War of 1812. The pirates were a major part of defending New Orleans in 1815. Thanks to the help of these bloodthirsty pirates, New Orleans was spared, and the British had no choice but to retreat. After the battle, Lafitte and his crew went right back to attacking merchant ships and harassing the Spanish Empire. They had extreme success until 1821, when U.S. authorities had had enough. Understanding that his days of crime were at an end, Lafitte took his most loyal men and fled the United States. And to this day, no one knows what became of him. Hyradine Barbarossa Hyradine Barbarossa was born sometime in the 1470s on the island of Lesbos. This island is in the Aegean Sea, currently a part of Greece, but until 1912, it was under Turkish dominion. Barbarossa, which is Italian for Redbeard, worked with his brother to become major pirates in the Mediterranean. When Spain completed their takeover of Granada in 1492, both Spain and Portugal attacked the North African coast with plans of taking over Africa piece by piece. This angered the Barbarossa brothers, and so they started pillaging the Spanish and Portuguese ships and causing harm wherever they could. They were absolutely aggressive to the Spanish and even took over the city of Algiers. Back in Turkey, the Ottomans realized they could use these pirates to their advantage against their enemies. And so the Barbarossa brothers went from pirates to government-funded navy men. They used their skills as pirates on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. Barbarossa's brother died in 1518 in a battle with the Spanish, but Hayreddin made a major name for himself. He eventually became Grand Admiral of the Ottoman Empire. Blackbeard When you think about scary pirates, the first name that probably pops into your head is Blackbeard. And while he was probably the most feared pirate of the 18th century and the most famous pirate in history, he may not have actually been that brutal. 300 years after Edward Teach had his head chopped off in battle, Historians and archaeologists have come together to shed some light on the man behind the mystery. Many merchants in the 1700s spoke of Blackbeard as if he were a vengeful demon. He had fierce and wild eyes, kept three pistols in a holster across his chest, and kept lit matches in his beard to make it look like a hot, glowing mass of hair. The truth is, Edward Teach was an extremely well-educated man from a family of serious notoriety, although we don't actually know who that family was. We know that he was wealthy, had an education, and that he was smarter than most pirates. Regardless of his background, he turned to piracy around the year 1715 and was dead three years later. He was killed in battle after being ambushed by the Virginia governor at the time, Alexander Spotswood. And while Blackbeard had a reputation as being a vicious pirate, there wasn't any evidence that he ever killed anyone. Historians believe he simply scared people into thinking he was terrifying, and this worked to his advantage. He made sailors so scared they would rather jump into the ocean than face him. Thanks for watching. Who's your favorite pirate? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time for more amazing history. Bye!